So we'll continue looking at some different specific types of continuous time signals. This next signal is what we call the continuous time exponential signal, and it has the form x of t equals e to the st. s, in general, is a complex number, and we break it down into real and imaginary parts. The real part we denote as sigma, and the imaginary part we denote as j omega. So in general, s can be a complex number. If we use Euler's equation, e to the st, which is just simply e to the quantity sigma plus j omega times t, we can break that down using properties of exponentials as e to the sigma t times e to the j omega t. And then here we're going to use Euler's on this part right here. e to the j omega t we know by definition from Euler's equation is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. So in general, what we see is that e to the st kind of has these two pieces. There's this e to the sigma t part, which is kind of a damping factor and controls whether the signal grows or decays. And then the imaginary part, the j omega, controls the frequency of these cosine and psi term, sine terms. So the omega controls whether it's oscillating or not and how quickly it may be oscillating. Just for uh, the sake of computation, which we'll need here in just a minute, we could also compute what is e to the s conjugate of t. Well, we know how to take the conjugate of a complex number. We replace all the j's with minus j's, so that turns into sigma minus j omega, which then turns into e to the sigma t times e to the minus j omega t. And then if we apply Euler's to this, we know what that is. It's cosine omega t minus j sine omega t. So we'll, we'll need these expressions here shortly. So what we see by expanding e to the st in this form is we see that in general this quantity e to the st is very dependent on what value for s, equivalently what values that you have for sigma and omega. So let's talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about some special cases of this exponential signal. First of all, what would happen if s was 0? If it was 0, then we can actually get out a constant function. So if we could put some c e to the st, e to the st is really e to the 0, e to the 0 is 1. So we can actually think of this exponential signal in the special case of s0 being equal to 1. And if we multiply that complex or the, that exponential signal by c, we can actually get out the constant value c from the exponential signal. So really contained in the exponential signal is a constant. So what about this special case, case 2? Let's set omega equal to 0 and let s just equal sigma. So we're kind of turning off the oscillation part or the imaginary component. In that case, we have e to the st, which is just simply e to the sigma t because the omega part has gone away. So this is just some type of monotonic exponential. If sigma is a negative number, say minus 2, we'd have e to the minus 2t which is a signal that, as time increases, decays as a function of time. If sigma was a positive number, say 4, e to the 4t, as t gets large, this signal would grow exponentially as a function of time. In either case, we have a monotonically increasing signal or a monotonically decreasing signal, so we think of this special case, when omega is 0, as a monotonic exponential. We can also get sinusoids, cosines and sines, out of the, comp of the exponential signal. So let's let, in this case, sigma equal 0, and let s be plus minus j omega. So we're going to turn off the sigma part and keep just omegas, basically the opposite of what we did here. We turned off the omega part and kept the sigma. So in that case, think about what e to the st is. e to the st is what we computed on the previous chart. It had e to the sigma t times the quantity cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. Well, e to the sigma t out front is just e to the 0 or 1, so all we're left with for this term is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. We also computed this on the previous chart. If you let sigma equals 0, you're left with simply cosine omega t minus j sine omega t. So when you combine these two terms, the sine terms go away, and you're left with just a cosine term plus a cosine. So this, after you plug in, simplifies to the sum of cosines. This is 2 times cosine, which divided by 2 just gives us a cosine. So we can actually write cosine omega t as the sum of exponential signals.
You can do something similar for sine. You could write sine omega t equals e to the st minus e to the s conjugate of t over 2. So we can do a similar thing to write sine omega t as a function of exponential signals. The most general case is really case 4, where neither sigma or omega is equal to 0. And in that case, we just call this an exponentially varying sinusoid that we can get out. If I was to add e to the st plus e to the s conjugate of t, I still get some cancellation, but I have this cosine oscillation and this damping factor on top of it. So as you deal with these exponential signals, depending on how you set s in terms of sigma and omega, depending on whether you have just a single exponential signal or maybe you have sums of different exponential signals. There are lots of different interesting signals that you can get out of the exponential signal family. This chart just kind of graphically explains what happens when you choose specific values for s. So this is the complex plane. This is the real axis, which we denote by sigma. This is the imaginary axis, which we denote by j omega. And any point s that you give me, I can locate in this complex plane. So for instance, if s was just equal to 5, I would start at the origin and just come out 5 units on the real axis, because s was a real number. If s was equal to minus 2j omega, I would start right here and come down 2 units on the omega axis. If s was 4 plus j4, that'd be 4 plus j4, would be some point out here. So any point in this complex plane is a potential value for s, and each of those values for s has a real component and imaginary component. The interesting part is this dividing line. This dividing line really um, determines and dictates what type of signal you have in terms of increasing or decreasing. If you're anywhere over here on what we call the right half plane, you're going to have an exponentially increasing signal, meaning as time goes on, your signal is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Sometimes it's oscillating as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's still nonetheless growing in magnitude. If you're in the left-hand plane, so any point over here, you are what we call an exponentially decreasing signal. This corresponds to terms that have e to the minus t terms. So these things, as time gets large, are decaying exponentially. So that wraps up kind of the comments I wanted to make about the exponential signal. In general, it's e to the st, and it has some interesting behavior and characteristics depending on what specific values for s you use. And you can get lots of different signals out of this um, family of signals by adding, subtracting, and doing different functions of them.